The Bolshevik Power by Alexander Rabinowitch. Chapter 11 Lenin's Campaign for an Insurrection. Judging by proceedings in the Petrograd Soviet and by the tenor of political resolutions appearing in the left press at the end of September, Petrograd workers and soldiers responded enthusiastically to the idea of an early Congress of Soviets to create a revolutionary government. The same cannot be said of Lenin, who was convinced that the party leadership in Petrograd was letting slip the last golden moments when the provisional government could be overthrown with ease. First from Weiberg and subsequently from the apartment of Margarita Fofanova on, an, on the northernmost edge of the Weiberg district, just off the rail line from Finland where he was living secretly, he delivered a series of slashing rebukes to his followers in the capital. These were coupled with ever more insistent demands that the provisional government be overthrown without further delay. The first of these verbal assaults took the form of an essay intended for publication in Rabachi Put, entitled Heroes of Fraud and the Mistakes of the Bolsheviks. It began with a scathing denunciation or a scathing denunciation of the Democratic State Conference, the majority socialists, and Kerensky, and ended with a thoroughgoing critique of the Bolsheviks themselves, wrote Lenin. The Bolsheviks should have walked out of the Democratic State Conference. Ninety nine percent of the Bolshevik delegation should have gone to the factories and barracks. The Bolsheviks, it turned out, had an erroneous attitude toward parliamentar parliamentarianism in moments of revolutionary and not constitutional crisis, and a mistake, mistaken attitude toward the socialist revolutionaries and Mensheviks. Comrade Zinoviev made a mistake in writing about the commune ambiguously, to say the least, so that it appeared that the commune, although victorious in Petrograd, might be defeated, as in France in 1871. This is absolutely untrue. If the commune were victorious in Petrograd, it would be victorious throughout Russia. It was also a mistake on his part to write that the Bolsheviks did right in proposing proportional representation in the presidium of the Petrograd Soviet. And comrade Kemenev was wrong in delivering the first speech at the conference in a purely constitutional spirit when he raised the foolish question of confidence or no confidence in the government. Written as the Democratic State Conference drew to a close, Heroes of Fraud and the Mistakes of the Bolsheviks was published in Rabichi Put on September 24th under the title Heroes of Fraud and with all direct criticism of the Bolsheviks edited out. Between September 22nd and 24th, Lenin worked on another newspaper essay from a public from a publicist's diary, which took the form of a daily journal. A portion of the entry for September 22nd reads, The more one reflects on the meaning of the so-called democratic conference, the more firmly convinced one becomes that our party committed a mistake in participating in it. We must boycott the, pre the pre-parliament we must leave it and go to the Soviet of workers, soldiers, and peasants' deputies, to the trade unions, to the masses in general. We must call them to the struggle. We must give them a correct and clear slogan. Disperse Kerensky's Bonapartist gang with its fake parliament. The Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries, even after the Kornilov revolt, refused to accept our compromise of peacefully transferring power to the Soviets. They have again sunk into the morass of mean and filthy bargaining with the cadets. Down with the Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries. Ruthlessly expel them from all revolutionary organizations. No negotiations, no communications with these friends of the Kishkins, and uh, uh, the friends of the Kornilovite landowners and capitalists. The next day, September 23rd, Lenin recorded Trotsky was for the boycott. Bravo, comrade Trotsky. 
boycottism was defeated in the Bolshevik group at the Democratic Conference. Long live the boycott. We cannot and must not under any circumstances reconcile ourselves to participation. A group at one of the conferences is not the highest organ of the party, and even the decisions of the highest organs are subject to revision on the basis of experience. We must strive at all cost to have the boycott question solved at a plenary meeting of the Central Committee and at an extraordinary party congress. There is not the slightest doubt that there are noticeable vacillations at the top of our party that may become ruinous. The editorial board of Rabachi Put, composed of Sokolnikov, Trotsky, Kamenev, Stalin, and Volodarsky, suppressed from a publicist's diary entirely, and instead on September 26th began publication of the tasks of the revolution, one of the articles written during Lenin's period of moderation in early September, when he had been seriously considering the possibility of compromise with the moderates. Lenin's patience was nearing the breaking point. On September 27th, he wrote a long letter to Smilga, giving vent to his frustrations and encouraging Smilga to take the initiative in, pre in preparing the overthrow of the government. Kerensky is obviously entering into an understanding with the Kornilov Kornilovites to use troops to put down the Bolsheviks. And what are we doing? We are only passing resolutions. It is necessary to agitate inside the party for an earnest attitude towards an armed uprising. This letter should be typed and delivered to comrades in Petrograd and Moscow. Take advantage of, of your high position, i.e. as chairman of the Regional Executive Committee of the Army, Fleet, and workers in Finland. Devote exclusive attention to the military preparation of the troops in Finland, plus the fleet, for the impending overthrow of Kerensky. Why should we tolerate three more weeks of war in Kerensky's Kornilovite preparations? Lenin returned to this theme two days later, very likely the day of his return to Petrograd. In an essay, the crisis has matured. Here he propounded the thesis that developments in all the major European countries indicated that the worldwide proletarian revolution was at hand, that the advantageous circumstances in which the Bolsheviks in Russia found themselves placed a special burden upon them, and that the Bolsheviks would be miserable traitors to the proletarian cause if they delayed seizing power any longer. In the last part of the essay directed to members of the Bolshevik Central, Moscow, and Petersburg committees, but not intended for publication, Lenin penned his most withering critique of the policies being pursued by his party's leadership. He even tendered his resignation from the Central Committee. He wrote, We must admit that there is a tendency among the leaders of our party which favors waiting for the Congress of Soviets and is opposed to taking power immediately. That tendency must be overcome or the, or the Bolsheviks will cover themselves with eternal shame and destroy themselves as a party. To wait for the Congress of Soviets is idiocy, for the Congress will give nothing and can give nothing. We have thousands of armed workers and soldiers in Petrograd who could at once seize the Winter Palace, the General Staff Building, the Telephone Exchange, and the large printing press. If we were to attack at once suddenly from three points, Petrograd, Moscow, and the Baltic Fleet, the chances are 100 to 1 that we would succeed with smaller sacrifices than on July 3rd to 5th. In submitting his resignation, Lenin offered the following explanation. In view of the fact that the Central Committee has even left unanswered the persistent demands I have been making for such a policy, the overthrow of the government, ever since the beginning of the Democratic Conference, in view of the fact that the central newspaper is deleting from my articles all references to such glaring errors on the part of the Bolsheviks as the shameful decision to participate in the pre-parliament, the admission of the Mensheviks to the presidium of the Soviet, etc., etc., I am compelled to regard this as a subtle hint at the unwillingness of the Central Committee even to consider this question, a subtle hint that I should keep my mouth shut and as a proposal for me to retire. I am compelled to tender my resignation from the Central Committee, which I hereby do, 
reserving for myself freedom to campaign among the party rank and file and at the party congress. For it is my profound conviction that if we wait for the Congress of Soviets and let the present moment pass, we will ruin the revolution. There is no evidence that this resignation was ever formally considered by the Central Committee. And as we shall see, Lenin was soon to participate in the deliberations of that body as if it had never been submitted. Lenin's campaign for support within the party at large began two days later, October 1st, with a letter addressed jointly to the Central, Moscow, and Petersburg committees, and also to Bolshevik membership of the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets. Lenin pointed to repression by the government of revolutionary unrest among the peasantry, mutinies in the German Navy, and the apparent beginnings of widespread revolutionary disturbances there, Bolshevik victories in local elections in Moscow, and increases in Bolshevik support among soldiers and major labor disputes involving railway and postal workers as evidence that procrastination is positively criminal, that the Bolsheviks have no right to wait for the Congress of Soviets and must take power at once. By so doing, they would save the world revolution, save the Russian revolution, and save the lives of hundreds of people at the front. At the same time, Lenin prepared an appeal to workers, peasants, and soldiers obviously intended for the broadest mass circulation. It read in part, Comrades, look around you. See what is happening in the countryside. See what is happening in the army, and you will realize that the peasants and soldiers cannot tolerate it any longer. Kerensky is again negotiating with the Kornilovite generals and officers to lead troops against the Soviets of workers and soldiers' deputies to prevent the Soviets from obtaining power. Go to the barracks, go to the Cossack units, go to the working people, and explain the truth to them. If power is in the hands of the, of the Soviets, there will be a workers' and peasants' government in Russia. It will immediately, without losing a single day, offer a just peace to all belligerent peoples. If power is in the hands of the Soviets, the landowners' estates will immediately be declared the inalienable property of the whole people. <clears throat> No, not one more day are the people willing to suffer postponement. Down with the government of Kerensky, who is conniving with the Kornilovite landowning generals to suppress the peasants, to fire on the peasants, to drag out the war. All, pa all power to the Soviets of workers and soldiers' deputies. Indications that the Central Committee could no longer successfully contain the dissemination of Lenin's appeals indeed that they were already having an impact on lower party organizations, appeared in the first days of October. One of Lenin's appeals for action had come into the possession of the Moscow Regional Bureau, firmly controlled by the militant wing of the Bolshevik organization in the Moscow era at the end of September. At a meeting of the Central Committee on October 3rd, Lomov, a member of the Bureau and a candidate member of the Central Committee, delivered a formal report on behalf of the Bureau aimed at bringing pressure to bear on the Central Committee to initiate preparations for the seizure of power. Lomov expressed concern that in the Moscow area, the mood was extremely tense, that the Bolsheviks had majorities in many Soviets, and that the masses were insistent on concrete action. Meanwhile, a party, meanwhile party members were simply marking time. The Central Committee heard Lamov out, but declined to discuss his report. At roughly the same time, on October 3rd or 4th, several of Lenin's appeals also reached militant leaders of the Bolshevik Petersburg Committee. In the pre-July period, the leadership of the Petersburg Committee frequently had stood significantly to the left of the Central Committee on issues relating to the development of the revolution and on occasion had acted quite independently in deciding major policy questions. This had led to friction between the Petersburg Committee and the Central Committee, and in the aftermath of the July uprising, the two organs apparently had reached a tacit understanding of sorts. The Petrograd organization would not make decisions potentially affecting the entire country without first obtaining the consent of the Central Committee. While, for its part, the Central Committee would attempt to ascertain 
the Petersburg Committee's views before making major policy decisions. To facilitate coordination between the two committees, Bubnov had been delegated to represent the Central Committee in the Petersburg Committee. Upon receipt of Lenin's letters, the leadership of the Petersburg Committee learned for the first time that the Central Committee had grossly violated this tacit agreement. Not only had it rejected Lenin's proposal to organize an armed uprising without consulting the Petersburg Committee, it had actively endeavored to conceal and misre misrepresent Lenin's views throughout the second half of September. As it turned out, the Petersburg Committee's nine-man executive commission was divided between a strong majority responsive to Lenin's appeals and a vocal minority that considered them premature. Nonetheless, the Central Committee's censor censorship of Lenin's views enraged executive commission members to a man. The commission's initial response was a formal request to the Central Committee for an immediate meeting between the Central Committee and representatives from Petersburg and Moscow to discuss the party's future tactical course. This request, dispatched on October 5th, no doubt played a role in prompting the Central Committee to reassess its policies. Within the Central Committee itself, however, a shift in outlook regarding strategy and tactics was already taking place. The pre-Parliament, now thoroughly restructured, was due to reconvene on October 7th, and at a meeting of the Central Committee on October 5th, proponents of a boycott insisted that the question of participation be reconsidered. Now that the par not th fuck. now that the pre-Parliament contained propertied elements and, in any case, had little political power, only Kamenev of those present on October 5th could find any merit in taking part. By a vote of all against one, it was agreed that the party would stage a walkout from the pre-Parliament at its opening session. Naturally, appalled at this decision, Kamenev immediately submitted a formal memorandum to the Central Committee, contending that withdrawal from the first session oriented the party's tactics in an extremely dangerous direction. And requesting to be relieved of all responsibility for representing the party in the Soviet Central Executive Committee and other political organs. Quite likely, at Kamenev's insistence, the boycott issue was discussed further at a meeting of the arriving Bolshevik pre parliament delegation on the afternoon of October 7th. As on September 21st, arguments in this assembly of Bolshevik representatives from subordinate party organizations throughout the country dragged on interminably and were at times extremely heated. Trotsky again presented the main case for a boycott. In opposition, members of the more conciliatory wings of the party, Kamenev and Ryazanov among them, no longer advocated participation in the pre-parliament, but urged merely that a withdrawal be postponed until the emergence of a serious issue, which would provide clear justification for a walkout. In the end, however, by a very narrow margin, the delegation endorsed an immediate boycott. Meanwhile, without waiting for a response from the Central Committee, the Executive Commission called together the full Petersburg Committee expressly to discuss Lenin's letters. This meeting was convened on October 5th at the Petersburg Committee's regular Narva District meeting place. At the same time as the Central Committee, gathered at Smolny, was debating a boycott of the pre-Parliament. The Executive Commission had agreed that this session should be closed to all but, re but regularly elected district representatives. Hence, improperly accredited party members were preliminary, pre fuck, preliminarily asked to leave. Lenin's letter of October 1st, calling for the immediate overthrow of the government, was then read aloud, after which Yucca Rakia took the floor on behalf of the Executive Commission to deliver a formal report on the current moment. Rikia had been among the Petersburg Committee's ultra-radicals on the eve of the July uprising and was one of those imprisoned in its aftermath. He now acted as spokesman for the Executive Commission majority, sympathetic to Lenin's appeals. 
In arguing the case for an immediate insurrection, Rakia focused per- particular attention on conditions in his native Finland. The mood of the troops in Finland, he declared, was solidly Bolshevik. Political power was effectively in the hands of the Bolshevik Regional Committee. The Regional Committee was at war with the Provisional Government, and the situation was such that it had to either surrender its position or go, or go further. There were rumors regarding the disarmament of Kronstadt, he added, and an explosive situation was developing there. For these reasons, he insisted that the party was in a life-or-death situation and urged that discussion focus exclusively on Lenin's recommendations and on technical matters connected with the preparation of an insurrection. The intense but always sober and pragmatic Volodarsky rose next to voice the concerns of the Executive Commission minority, which remained skeptical of the efficacy of immediate action. Volodarsky urged his listeners to weigh their steps carefully. We have a responsibility to the working class, he argued. At present, the army gets 80% of the bread, nine-tenths of the meat, etc., and no measures can help this. In Volodarsky's estimate, the demoralization of the army at the front was also reason for pause. At the front, he declared, there is nothing but tiredness. The soldiers want an end to the war. We say that if our peace terms are not accepted, we will fight the imperialists. But the army will not take part in a revolutionary war. Volodarsky also expressed doubt regarding the party's concrete military support, both locally and in the country at large. Petrograd and Finland are not all of Russia, and yet even here we do not have sufficient strength compared with what can be mobilized against us from the front. If we could just hope to have bread for 10 to 15 days, if we could raise allowances, this would increase our influence and allow for the possibility of rousing the army. But the way things stand, we would not be able to do this. These are the toughest months for procuring food supplies. Even if the entire countryside supported us and agreed to furnish bread, we would still have no means of transporting it. Volodarsky asserted that the revolutionary situation abroad was another factor that called for a delay. Only revolutionary outbreaks in the West can save us, he declared. The revolutionary movement is growing among Western European workers, and if we do not force developments, this ally will only increase in strength. While recommending caution, Volodarsky took pains to disassociate himself from the policies advocated by the party's right, and to suggest that his differences with Lenin centered upon tactics rather than goals. Even at the Democratic Conference, he observed, I was against participation in the pre-Parliament. We made an unpardonable error. The correct revolutionary path is to reject compromises, but not to force developments. At the same time, building up fighting strength so that power can be taken when it is inevitable and unavoidable. The hard thing he contended was not to seize power, but to keep it. We must show that the masses, we must show the masses that our path the course along which we came to power is the only right one, he concluded. We must understand that taking power, we will be forced to lower wages, to increase unemployment, to institute terror. We do not have the right to reject these methods, but there is no need to rush into them. Mikhail Lashevik, the only other member of the Executive Commission who can be identified definitively as sharing Volodarsky's views, now rose to support his colleague. Since 1906, Lashevik had been immersed almost totally in revolutionary activity. He had been drafted in 1915, and the midsummer of 1917 found him attached to the rebellious 1st Machine Gun Regiment. On the eve of the July days, he was perhaps the only Bolshevik activist among the machine gunners who was genuinely alarmed about the prospect of an early insurrection. Lashevik had devoted much of his time to work in the Petrograd Soviet, where he was elected chairman of the Bolshevik fraction. At the 6th Bolshevik Party Congress, along with Volodarsky, he was among those staunchly defending the Soviets as revolutionary institutions against the attacks of the Leninists. On the present occasion, he was similarly forthright, articulating practical concerns which subsequent events showed to have been shared 
by others, but which at this point relatively few were willing to voice. Lashevik acknowledged that the revolution had reached a critical moment, but warned his listeners against trying to move too far too fast. We have heard reports from all regions, and because of this, the situation facing Russia is clear to us, he said, referring to reports made in the Petrograd Soviet and at the Democratic State Conference. It has become apparent that the Russian economy, both industry and food production, is close to ruin. The Mensheviks themselves have acknowledged that the revolutionary measures will, will be required to check this rush into disaster. Even the immediate conclusion of peace will not prevent the crash. Power is coming to us, this is a fact. We must accept it, even though there is a 98% chance that we will be defeated. But must we take power now? I believe we ought not force matters. By taking power now, we will turn elements against us that are bound to come our way later. Wavering elements are increasingly coming to recognize the necessity of revolutionary measures, which we begin advocating to which we began advocating two months ago. Lenin's strategic plan limps on all four legs. Let's not fool ourselves. We will not be able to furnish bread. The likelihood is great that we will not be able to provide peace. While the war is going on, I don't expect a revolution in Germany. An immediate decree transferring land to the peasants would probably raise the spirit of the masses. But even then, they probably would not go to fight. We must coolly take cognizance of all this when we make our decision. Lenin hasn't given us a sufficient explanation of why it is necessary to seize power now before the Congress of Soviets. The Congress of Soviets will provide an apparatus and if the delegates are in favor of taking power, it will be a different question. I agree with Rakia that we must prepare. We stand on a, vol a volcano. I wonder, as I wake up each morning, has it already erupted? Boki, the secretary of the Petersburg Committee, now interrupted the discussion to read aloud five theses written by Lenin a day or two earlier. They were intended primarily for consideration at a city party conference scheduled to open on October 7th. In the theses, Lenin had outlined his argument against participating in the pre-parliament and tying the overthrow of the government to the Congress of Soviets, and had reiterated the necessity of organizing an armed uprising as quickly as possible. Under the influence of Lenin's militant stand, several speakers rose to attack the views of Volodarsky and Lashevich, and to defend those of Lenin. Karitinov commented sarcastically, Volodarsky and Lashevich have been infected by the atmosphere at Smolny, as a political party, we are aiming for power, and I think we have come to a time when we can realize this aim. Rikia took the floor once again. I thought all of us were revolutionaries, he declared. But when I heard Volodarsky and Lashevich, I began to wonder. Taking issue with the claim that a Bolshevik government would, would founder because of inability to maintain industrial production and provide essential food supplies, Rikia expressed the opinion that much of Russia's economic distress resulted from the sabotage of industrialists, a problem that would be eliminated by a revolutionary government. Moreover, he insisted that in delaying the seizure of power, the Bolsheviks were alienating rather than acquiring support. The Petersburg Committee's discussion had by now been going on for many hours. At the conclusion of the Central Committee meeting, which had taken place simultaneously, Bubnov Sokolnikov and Smilga went at, went at once to the Petersburg Committee meeting, still in progress upon their arrival. All three were, of course, much closer to Lenin than to Kamenev in political sentiment, a fact which they immediately made clear. Indeed, their primary concern was to ascertain how local level leaders in closest touch with workers and soldiers felt the masses would respond to the Bolsheviks. Boycott of the par of the pre-parliament would respond to the Bolshevik boycott of the pre-parliament, which the Central Committee had just decided upon, and how and when, in their view, power might most easily be seized. If any participants in this meeting, apart from Volodarsky and Lashevich, were inclined to argue against an immediate insurrection, 
the militancy of Bubnov, Sokolnikov, and Smilga probably inhibited them from taking the floor. Although no member of the Petersburg Committee suggested initiating an uprising at once, as Lenin seemed to have been recommending, many of the most influential Petersburg Committee members, among them Latsis, Kalinin, Molotov, and Grigory Evdokimov, spoke in support of a militant course. The, indef the indefatigable Latsis pointed to Russian naval defeats in the Baltic and expressed fear that the destruction of the Baltic fleet was imminent, a development which would make the seizure of power significantly more difficult. Kalinin insisted somewhat ambiguously that the question of seizing power was now before the party, and all that remained was the difficult question of ascertaining the proper moment for attack. Molotov spoke in a similar vein. Presently, we are on the eve of an overturn. Our task now is not to restrain the masses, but to select the most opportune moment for taking power into our own hands. Finally, Ev, Ev Dokomov, a member of the Central Soviet of Factory Shop Committees, asserted that the soldiers' great thirst for peace was yet another argument for early action against the government, since a second Kornilov might appear with peace as his slogan and then we will be strangled. Towards the close of the meeting, Rakia proposed that, before adjourning, the Petersburg Committee should attempt to arrive at a decision regarding the preparation of an uprising. However, Volodarsky advised that passage of a formal resolution be delayed until the convocation two days hence of the much larger citywide party conference. This proposal was apparently acceptable to the majority, for the published record breaks off abruptly at this point. Not long after the full Petersburg Committee had dispersed, however, the Executive Commission made a start at implementing Lenin's recommendations. As Latsis' leader explained, while it was necessary to be ready for serious combat, so far no systematic preparations had been made. The Executive Commission now delegated three of its members, Yakov Fenikstein, Ivan Moskvin, and Latsis, to initiate an evaluation of the party's military strength, and in general to prepare district committees for action against the government. All this record records Latsis was undertaken without informing the Central Committee. Word of what the Executive Commission was up to did not take long to reach the Central Committee, whose members, it will be recalled, had been apprehensive about the potentially explosive reaction of radically inclined local level leaders from the time they had received Lenin's mid-September letters. The Committee met at once to discuss the problem. The published record of this meeting on October 7th is brief indicating only that Bubnov reported the formation of the Executive Commission of a Bureau to ascertain the mood of the masses and to establish close contact between them and party centers, and that after considering and discussing the importance of proper coordination and precise information, it was decided to create a Bureau attached to the Central Committee for information concerning the struggle against the counter-revolution. Trotsky, Sverdlov, and Bubnov were designated as the Central Committee's representatives in this bureau. Nevsky and Podvoisky from the military organization and Latsis and Moskvin from the Petersburg Committee were subsequently named to the bureau as well. There is no evidence that the bureau's function actively or that the bureau functioned actively for the time being the Central Committee's primary objective in establishing such a body seems to have been to undercut the operation initiated by the Executive Commission. On the evening of October 7th, Kerensky and his cabinet representatives of the Allied Diplomatic Corps, nearly 500 delegates from all parts of Russia and a large contingent of journalists, gathered in the stately white and crimson hall of the Marinsky Palace, the former meeting place of the Imperial State Council, for the ceremonial opening of the pre-parliament Befitting the times, the imperial crest over the speaker's tri tribune and its centennial portrait of the state council by Repin were discreetly concealed behind red draperies. Most of the audience, most of the audience was in place with the fifty-three Bolshevik delegates arrived, or when, fuck, 
Most of the audience was in place when the 53 Bolshevik delegates arrived, directly from their heated deliberations at Smolny. This first session was given over largely to patriotic declarations and appeals to law and order by Kerensky, by the aging populist Ekaterina Breshko Breshkovskaya, a senior member of the pre-parliament, and by Av Av Fuck Avksentiev, its chairman. As the as the session drew to a close, Trotsky demanded the floor for an emergency announcement. Mounting the speaker's platform, Trotsky launched into a denunciation of the provisional government and the pre-parliament as tools of the counter-revolutionary bourgeoisie and warned that the revolution was on the verge of being crushed. Obviously choosing his words more for the benefit of Petrograd workers and soldiers than for his immediate audience, he sounded a ringing battle cry. At a time when Wilhelm's troops are threatening Petrograd, the government of Kerensky and Konovalov is preparing to flee Petrograd, leaving the Provisional Council. We are appealing to workers, soldiers, and peasants of all Russia for vigilance and fortitude. Petrograd is in danger, he roared, struggling to be heard over a storm of protests from the center and right. The revolution and the people are in danger. The government is intensifying this threat and the ruling parties are helping it. Only the people can save themselves and the country. We turn to the people, all power to the Soviets, all land to the people. Long live an immediate, just, democratic peace. Long live the Constituent Assembly. The Bolshevik delegates now rose from their seats and filed out of the hall to the accompaniment of hoots and jeers. Bastards, someone shouted. Go to your German trains, hollered another in the audience as the last of the Bolsheviks disappeared through the door. Predictably, Trotsky's inflammatory declaration and the Bolsheviks' demonstrative walkout from the pre-parliament created a sensation, touching off a wave of speculation regarding the party's next move. Literally everywhere, noted a reporter for Novaya Zizin on October 8th, in long queues among people casually congregating in the streets and trolleys, rumors are circulating about an uprising being prepared by the Bolsheviks. Still, it is unlikely that anyone took special notice when, on the evening of October 10th, Members of the Bolshevik Central Committee bundled in heavy coats against the late fall chill and a, and a drizzly rain slipped out of Smolny one by one to attend a strategy session in a secret meeting place across the Neva, far out on the Petersburg side. This was to be Lenin's first direct confrontation with the Central Committee since his, his return from Finland. It had been carefully organized by Sverdlov at Lenin's behest. By an ironic twist of fate, the gathering was to be held in the apartment of the left Menshevik Sukhanov, that unsurpassed chronicler of the revolution who had somehow managed to turn up at almost every important political meeting in Petrograd since the February revolution. But on this occasion, Sukhanov was not in attendance. His wife, Galina Flaxerman, a Bolshevik activist since 1905, and in 1917, a member of the staff of Izvestia, an aide in the Central Committee Secretariat, once had offered Sverdlov the use of the Sukhanov flat, should the need arise. It was a roomy apartment with several entrances, so the comings and goings of a large number of people would not attract particular attention. Sverdlov had decided to make use of this location for the October 10th meeting. For her part, Flaxerman ensured that her meddlesome husband would remain away on his historic on this historic night. The weather is wretched and you must promise not to try to make it all the way back home tonight. She had counseled solicit solicitously as he departed for work early that morning. At the start of the October 10th Central Committee meeting, while a few latecomers straggled in, Sverdlov disposed of routine business and also passed on some disturbing late reports filtering into the party's offices of counter-revolutionary plots allegedly being hatched on, on the Northern Front and at Western Front headquarters in Minsk. Minsk. 
Sverdlov noted that these rumors had not yet been confirmed and suggested that one feasible way of dealing with any incipient plots in Minsk was to seize military headquarters there. He added that pro-Bolshevik troops in Minsk were also available for dispatch to Petrograd. Lenin soon appeared, clean-shaven, and wearing a wig, he looked very, he looked every bit like a Lutheran minister, Kalantai later recalled. By 10 p.m., at least a dozen of the Central Committee's 21 members, including Lenin, Bubnov, Zer Zerzinsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Kalantai, Lomov, Sokolnikov, Stalin, Trotsky, Yuritsky, and Yakovleva, Yakovleva? were seated around the Sukhanov's dining room table in the dim illumination provided by a hanging lamp. Their attention soon turned to the main item of business, the current moment. Lenin began the discussion with an impassioned plea for immediate action, which lasted nearly an hour. At the outset, he reproached his associates for indifference toward the question of an uprising. The party, he charged, should have concerned itself with the technical side of this problem long ago. In support of his claim that time was of the essence, Lenin again expressed certainty that the government was about to surrender Petrograd to the Germans as a means of stifling the revolution. Apparently, unfounded rumors that Kerensky was contemplating giving up Petrograd without a fight circulated widely at this time, but it is difficult to say whether Lenin actually believed such a step likely or was merely trying to make the strongest possible case for immediate action. Referring to other vague rumors of a possible peace settlement at Russia's expense and indications of revolutionary unrest abroad, he also insisted that the international situation provided another reason for the Bolsheviks to take the initiative at once. Echoing the arguments advanced in some of his earlier letters, Lenin went on to compare the prevailing situation with the time of the abortive July uprising, concluding that in the intervening period of the Bolsheviks, in the intervening period, the Bolsheviks had made gigantic strides in building up support. The indifference of the masses to revolutionary action could be explained by their boredom with words and resolutions. The majority is with us now, Lenin insisted, and the political situation is fully ripe for the transfer of power. It was now crucial to discuss the technical aspect of the overthrow of the government. Yet instead, like the defensists, the Bolsheviks were inclined to think of the systematic preparation of an uprising as something akin to a political sin. To wait for the Constituent Assembly, which obviously won't be with us, said Lenin, was senseless and would only complicate the task. Lenin, w Lenin wound up his remarks with some concrete suggestions about how and when the insurrection against the government should start. The party must use the Northern Region Con Congress of Soviets, opening at Smolny the next morning, as well as the proposed offer of soldiers from Minsk and the raid of military headquarters there for the beginning of decisive action. The official published account of the debate following Lenin's appeal is brief and very incomplete. The remarks of Kamenev and Zinoviev, Lenin's main opponents, are not reflected in the official record at all. References to this meeting in other contemporary documents and descriptions in several published memoirs reveal that the discussion was passionate and tense, that it lasted through the night and into the early morning, and that eventually virtually everyone present spoke. Lamov and Yakovleva apparently reported on the tactical views of Bolshevik leaders in Moscow and on the political situation in the Moscow area generally. Yuritsky voiced grave concern about the party's reliable military strength in Petrograd, yet asserted somewhat contradictorily that if the Bolsheviks were bent on an uprising, then it was necessary to begin making definite preparations for it. Sverdlov, drawing upon information flowing into the Central Committee Sectariat, reported on conditions elsewhere in Russia and evidently strongly supported the idea of an insurrection. Late at night, the assembled leaders were badly shaken by an insistent knock at the door. The caller turned out to be Fl Flaxerman's brother, Yuri, a military school cadet and also a Bolshevik, who had come to help with the Somovar. 
Not long after this momentary fright, Kemenev and Zinoviev, the latter sporting an unaccustomed beard and with his curly hair clipped short, tried their best to counter Lenin's arguments, attacking the idea of an armed uprising on both theoretical and practical grounds. As the head of the April conference, Kamenev, now joined by Zinoviev, underlined the importance of the petty bourgeoisie in the developments of the Russian Revolution. As the two put it in a summation of their arguments, which they later prepared, the Russian working class by itself could not complete the present revolution. We simply cannot lose sight of the fact that between us and the bourgeoisie, there is an enormous third camp, that of the petty bourgeoisie. This camp joined with us during the Kornilov affair and brought us victory. It will ally with us again more than once, but for the time being, it is closer to the bourgeoisie than to the Bolsheviks. Kemenev and Zinoviev also voiced skepticism regarding Lenin's assumptions that a majority of the Russian population now backed the Bolsheviks and that the international proletariat was in the main for the Bolsheviks. In their view, a majority of Russian workers and a significant percentage of soldiers supported the Bolsheviks, but everything else is questionable. They suggested, for example, that if elections to the Constituent Assembly were held in the prevailing circumstances, a majority of peasants would vote for the SRs. As for the soldiers who now supported the Bolsheviks, they would run away should the Bolsheviks be forced to conduct a revolutionary war. Granting some validity to Lenin's argument that it would be more difficult for the German government to fight against a revolutionary Russia, which proposed a democratic peace, they nonetheless considered it unlikely that such a handicap would deter the Germans. At the same time, as far as Kamenev and Zinoviev were concerned, the idea that the Bolsheviks in Russia could count on significant aid from revolutionary workers abroad was without foundation. While conceding that there were important signs of growing revolutionary unrest in Germany and Italy, they insisted that it was a long way from this to any kind of active support for a proletarian revolution in Russia which had declared war on the entire bourgeois world. Moreover, if the Bolsheviks in Russia were to suffer defeat, the revolutionary movement abroad would be dealt a major blow. The outbreak of serious revolutions in Europe would make it obligatory for Bolsheviks in Russia to take power at once, they argued. Only after the beginning of this upheaval abroad would, would the success of a proletarian revolution in Russia be assured. Such a time was coming, they acknowledged, but it was most definitely but it most definitely had not yet arrived. Finally, Kamenev and Zinoviev contended that Lenin's assessment of Bolshevik strength and of the government's isolation and weakness in Petrograd was vastly exaggerated. Neither workers nor, so nor soldiers were bursting for a fight, while in any case the military troops at the government's disposal were far stronger than those supporting the revolution. Moreover, supported by the Central Executive Committee, the Provisional Government would almost certainly request help from the front. In view of this, the party would be forced to fight in circumstances very different from those at the time of the struggle against Kornilov. Then the party had fought alongside the SRs and Mensheviks and even some close allies of Kerensky. Now it would be necessary to take on the Black Hundreds, plus the cadets, plus Kerensky and the Provisional Government plus the Central Executive Committee and the SRs and Mensheviks. For the party, the consequences of such a struggle would be inevitable defeat. As an alternative to the immediate uprising advocated by Lenin, Kamenev and Zinoviev urged that the party adhere to a nonviolent political course, a defensive posture aimed at acquiring the strongest possible representation for the masses at the Constituent Assembly. Countering Lenin's contention that if allowed more time, the government would successfully torpedo the Constituent Assembly, they expressed certainly that the bourgeoisie was too weak to implement its counter-revolutionary objectives, or even to effectively manipulate elections to the Constituent Assembly. Maintained Kamenev and Zinoviev, Through the army, through the workers, we have a revolver pointed at the temple of the bourgeoisie. If it even considered attempting to do away with the Constituent Assembly, it would again push the petty bourgeois parties to us, 
and the revolver would be triggered. Sympathy for the Bolsheviks would continue to grow while the cadet Menshevik SR bloc would gradually disintegrate. Support for the party in the Constituent Assembly, working in conjunction with the Soviets, would be so strong that the Bolsheviks' enemies would be forced to make concessions at every step or risk the creation of a majority bloc of Bolsheviks. Left SRs, non-party peasant representatives, and the like that would, th that would put through the party's program. The only way such a scenario might be disrupted, Zinoviev and Kemenev concluded, would be if the party initiated an untimely insurrection such as that proposed by Lenin, thereby subjecting the proletariat to attack from the entire counter-revolution allied with the petty bourgeois democracy. In sum, these were the arguments advanced by Kemenev and Zinoviev. Perhaps in a broader party forum such as that assembled in Petrograd during the Democratic State Conference, they might even now have attracted strong support. But such potential sympathizers as Nogin and Rykov were not present at the historic gathering of October 10th, and everyone else sided with Lenin. Apart from Kamenev and Zinoviev, differences among Central Committee members on this occasion no longer revolved around fundamental theoretical issues or the question of whether or not to overthrow the provisional government and transfer power to the Soviets, but centered on how soon and in what manner this might be done, and whether or not it was necessary to associate an uprising with the Congress of Soviets. In the resolution which Lenin proposed at the close of the October 10th meeting, these issues were somewhat blurred, hastily scratched out with a gnawed end of a pencil on a sheet of paper torn from a child's notebook. It read in part, The Central Committee acknowledges that the international situation as it affects the Russian Revolution, as well as the military situation, and the fact that the proletarian party has gained majorities in the Soviets. All this, coupled with the peasant insurrection and the swing of popular confidence to our party, and finally the obvious preparations for a second Kronolovchina makes armed insurrection the order of the day. Recognizing that an armed uprising is inevitable and the time fully ripe, the Central Committee instructs all party organizations to be guided accordingly and to consider and decide all practical questions from this standpoint. The Northern Region Congress of Soviets, the withdrawal of the troops from Petrograd, the action of comrades in Moscow and Minsk, etc. This call to arms was adopted by a vote of 10 to 2. Kalantai remembered that as soon as the vote was taken, the prevailing tension evaporated and everyone suddenly felt starved. Yuri Flaxerman produced the samovar along with some cheese, sausage, and black bread, and the hungry group immediately pounced on the food. Arguments continued for a bit, Kalantai recalled, but they were now interspersed with humor and good-natured jibes at Kamenev and Zinoviev. Thus ended this historic meeting between Lenin and the Bolshevik Central Committee. Historians in the Soviet Union frequently have viewed the night of October 10th as the moment when doubts about a militant revolutionary course within the Central Committee were, for practical purposes, eliminated, after which Bolshevik organizations everywhere set about energetically preparing a popular armed uprising along the lines urged by Lenin. This interpretation does not accurately describe the circumstances. The Central Committee resolution of October 10th, which left the exact character and timing of an insurrection to the discretion of subordinate Bolshevik organizations, did not resolve the very profound differences of opinion regarding revolutionary tactics that still existed between Lenin and other party leaders more acutely attuned to the specific political situation prevailing in Petrograd. As we shall see, these tactical divergences were to have great significance in the subsequent development of the revolution. This is not to suggest that the Central Committee meeting of October 10th was unimportant. The October 10th resolution on the current moment made the seizure of power the order of the day. For the Bolsheviks, this constituted a major advance over the corresponding resolution at the 6th Congress, which had merely, which had merely acknowledged the necessity of an armed uprising as well as the formal reversal of the orientation towards a peaceful development of the revolution, which had shaped the party's policies throughout September. While Kamenev and Zinoviev now watched in dismay, word of the Central Committee's decision and call to arms was spread to key party committees around the country. Looking back over the period between Kornilov, 
between the Kornilov affair and the decision of October 10th, one can see that, as in April, chief responsibility for this drastic transformation and the outlook of the party's top hierarchy belongs to Lenin. It was Lenin who, over a period of several weeks, alternately cajoled, pressured, and threatened his colleagues, and who, by force of argument and personal authority, ultimately succeeded in turning a majority of the Central Committee towards an insurrectionary course. This major personal victory of Lenin's should be borne in mind as we turn a consideration of political developments in Petrograd and intra-party disputes over tactics between October 10th and the Bolshevik seizure of power. Few modern historical episodes better illustrate the sometimes decisive role of an individual in historic events.